Um, this is Pastor Carl Felton from Hopeville Church um, coming to bring us the word, and we're so grateful that he is here. I'm going to pray for him. He's going to come up, and he's going to give us the word today. So come and pray with me. Dear Father, we just thank you for um, this opportunity to hear the word from a brother in the faith. Um, who is wanting to help us to know more of Jesus Christ. I pray for Pastor Carl, um, that you would just use him, um, that your Holy Spirit would do a lot of work and has already done so much work in his life and in his heart, and that he would continue to do work um, in our hearts and our, our minds today. And so I just pray that the words of his mouth and the meditations of his heart, would they be acceptable in his sight, that you would just help him, just help him to help us to know more of this Jesus who we love and who will not um, fail us in any way, shape, or form. We thank you so much, Lord. Praise you. In your most glorious name I pray. Amen. Thank you, brother. Good morning, Village Church. Good morning. It's great to be here with you all today. Uh, as he shared, I'm Pastor Carl from Hopeville Church. I lead the students ministry there. Uh, but it's really great to be here with you all today. Uh, Usually I have my wife with me, uh, but she actually leads the presentation team at our church, and everyone called out today. So this would be my first time preaching without my wife in the space. <laughs> so just please be supportive. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. But uh, it's really great to be here with you all today. This morning we're going to be talking about uh, your thoughts have power, uh, but Jesus has more. Uh, this is a sermon all about uh, our minds and how, we, uh, how our mindset can impact our faith journey with Jesus. Uh, so I know Pastor Julian just prayed, but I'm going to pray one more time because that's just typically what I do before I preach. <laughs> uh, Father God, thanks so much for this morning. Uh, thank you, Lord, for all the people that have gathered here today. <sighs> May you meet us here today. Pray for anyone who came in the room carrying heaviness or just looking to experience your goodness today. I pray that we would all just experience your goodness I pray, Lord, that you would uh, speak through me. Let it not be myself, but let it be a word that is inspired by you. Let it fall on fertile ground in our hearts. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Growing up, uh, I feel like every kid has something that they're really into. Uh, for some, it's superheroes. Uh, for some, it's just someone like SpongeBob or Paw Patrol. Uh, and, but what's interesting is in every phase of your life, I think everyone can name something that was really captivated their attention. Uh, I know younger in my life, my early years, I was really into the Power Rangers and Dragon Ball Z. Uh, but as I got older, uh, it was no longer cool to talk about Power Rangers and Dragon Ball Z in school anymore, right? By the time you get to middle school, is no one's watching those shows anymore. It's, it's no longer cool. Uh, so you kind of had to find something new to be invested in. Uh, so as we got older, I, I never forget in 2005 when I was in middle school, Batman Begins came out. And as a kid, I never played a lot of attention to Batman. Uh, just wasn't really into him. Uh, but then in 2008, my sophomore year of high school, The Dark Knight came out. And that was a very cool movie. Like, I, it had everything that I was looking for, action, drama, suspense. It had everything. Uh, but what was interesting was not really just the coolness of Batman, but I was more so captivated by his origin story. You see, as a kid, uh, Bruce, uh, he didn't just become Batman. There was something that happened in his life that led him to becoming Batman. When he was a kid, he went to an opera show with his parents. And while he was at the opera show, he got scared uh, with something that was happening on stage in the scene. And his father, being an intentional man, looked over and said, hey, man, are you okay? Would you like to go? And he shook his head and he said yes. But when he and his family exited the opera show, they exited through a back alley. And unfortunately, they would be approached by a gunman who would rob them of their money, who would rob them of their jewelry. And next thing he did was he actually killed Bruce's parents. So here we have a little boy who was scared at an opera show, and then his worst nightmare actually happens, right? His parents end up getting killed. Unfortunately, from this moment, Bruce will become an orphan and begin to be raised by his, the, his family butler. 
And as he was raised by his family butler, he was processing, I can imagine that he was processing all types of emotions. The fact that his parents' death happened because he was scared in an opera show and wanted to leave. He spent his young years, he spent his teenage years, his young adult years processing and owning his parents' death, almost taking a sense of responsibility. Bruce carried a a deep sense of shame and guilt and carrying all these responsibilities that a little boy, now a man, should have never had to carry and process. But see, this is how his thoughts were impacting his life. One thing his thoughts did to him was they made him think that every time danger arise, he had to play the hero. He was so frustrated by what happened to his parents as a little boy and how it impacted his life that he felt like he never wanted to see anyone go through pain and suffering again. He felt like he had to be the answer. Unfortunately, the way that he took responsibility impacted his adult life. What did he do? He became Batman. He chose to become someone that he was not in order to address the pain and the trauma in his life. He thought that by saving others and playing the hero in other people's story and in the city of Gotham, that that could solve and resolve the deeply rooted pain from losing his parents as a young child. It seems to me that when you look at the life of Bruce Wayne, we're seeing him live out this imprisonment. He seems to be imprisoned by pain. He seems to be imprisoned by shame. He seems to be imprisoned by guilt, so much so that it drove him to become someone that he wasn't. People of God, this is what I like to call the Batman versus Bruce Wayne effect. It is when things happen in our lives, and because we don't face them, we tend to put on a mask. And when we put on this mask, we are, are living out a story that isn't our story, but it's the way that we cope with our pain and move forward in life. It's a natural and a personal resolve that we tend to bring a situation to a close. And so I'm not sure what you're carrying. I'm not sure what experiences have shaped your life or given you a certain mindset of how you go through life, what types of pain and trauma you're carrying, but I do know that although we wear masks, some of us, not all of us, that's never how God intended us for to live. He never intended us to process our pain in such a way that we become someone that we're not just so that we can get through life. He never intended for us to have these experiences and carry them as if they're our fault. He never intended for us to need a mask to show up in the world and live a double life. Even still, life has happenings. Things happen. People do hurt our feelings. We do have traumatic experiences. And it's only natural that they hurt us in such a way that it changes us and the way we show up in the world. Well, I believe that even though this is natural, the Bible gives us a plan for how to address pain, how to address trauma, how to protect ourselves. And today is not going to be a whole roadmap, but just an idea of how I believe Jesus wants us to process through and live and cope with different things that happen to us. I want to take us to Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. I just realized I left my Bible in my bag. (laughs) Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23 says, Guard your heart above all else, for it is the source of life. Guard your heart above all else, for it is the source of life. I'm going to read in a different version. Uh, The NIV says, above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Thank you, Julie. I appreciate you so much. (laughs) Proverbs 4.23 in in New Living Translation says, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. And I'll read one more from the... Good News Translation says, be careful how you think, 
for your life is shaped by your thoughts. Be careful for how you think, for your life is shaped by your thoughts. I'm not going to exegete Batman's life, but just using it as a comparison for how our human nature tends to be when we experience heavy thoughts, heavy feelings, heavy emotions. When certain things happen to us, when certain thoughts enter our brain and we begin to continually process them, we can kind of use it and it becomes the new steering wheel for our lives. I think it's only natural, it's only human nature, but that is why it's emphasized here that we need to guard our hearts for it determines the course of our life. This is trying to tell us the things that the way that we feel, the way that we process pain, the way we process our emotions can determine our next steps. So what, let, let's, let's go a little bit deeper into Proverbs chapter 4. So the book of Proverbs, most of it was written by King Solomon. But what's interesting about this first section in Proverbs is this is uh, the, the first section is the wisdom section of Proverbs. You'll often find in these first few uh, chapters in Proverbs that they, they begin with my son or my child or, or hearken unto this or listen to this. This is, this is a moment where Solomon is, is kind of in his bag of, of being his nickname, the teacher, right? That's Solomon's nickname. King Solomon's nickname is the teacher. But, but in this, he's trying to emphasize different teachings so that we would listen to them and use them for moral wisdom and use them uh, to live in such a way that, that honors and glorifies God. One thing that's also interesting uh, after doing some further reading was when Solomon was writing this, what they were facing during his time was kind of a, an awakening in the culture where people were starting to get shaky faith and, and they were starting to be fans and not true followers of God and they were just distracted and, and, and not focused. So what he was doing when he was writing this section of Proverbs is he was reminding us what's most important. He was reminding us that what's most important is protecting your heart, that if we protect our heart, then we will be able to preserve the inner being. We will be able to preserve the way of life. We will be able to preserve the things in us that God has put in us and wants to continue to develop in us so that we can live in such a way that honors and glorifies him. That's what a lot of the wisdom Proverbs are doing for us. They're showing us how can we preserve this Jesus way of life. So when he says, above all else, guard your heart, he's saying, don't forget that when you do this, you will be able to remain pure, you will be able to remain righteous, and you will be able to align yourself with God's wisdom, and the outcomes in your life will be associated with those choices. That is why it is important for us to guard your heart. And secondly, uh, the second phrase says, for everything you do or for your life flows from it or for us the, the source of life. This verse highlights the interconnectedness between the condition of one's heart and the outcomes in your life. It also highlights that the character that others see in your life are coming from what's in your heart. All in all, Proverbs 4.23 is conveying a powerful message about our heart's role in shaping our life and our actions. Now, I want to go to the mind. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 7. Simply it reads, For as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. In this verse, what I believe King Solomon was trying to get us to understand is that it is our thoughts and our beliefs that shake our character. But all of those things start in our mind. Those things shape the course of our lives. Those things shape the, the way people experience us. Our, everything begins in our heart and our mind. Our feelings and our emotions and our processing and decision making here. There was a theologian named Norman Vincent Powell, and he had a quote that says, A man is not what he thinks, what he thinks he is. I'll read it one more time. A man is not what he thinks, but what he thinks he is. And what I believe that he was trying to convey to us is, we all have an image or an idea of how we show up in the world, but that is not who we are. 
Who we are is what's happening beneath the surface. Who we are is kind of our self-talk. Who we are is what we're consuming and how we're processing it. That's who we are. We need to realize the power of our thoughts and that that is what's shaping our lives. There's another quote that says, we see the world not as it is, but we see the world as we are. A lot of our thoughts and our experiences are based on our level of perspective. It's just food for thought. But let's go a little bit deeper into the functioning of the mind and and why it's so important that we protect our heart and we protect our mind. The mind is where thinking takes place. In here we create meaning. We process data. We locate patterns and we make comparisons and we make decisions. The mind is also where we monitor the feelings and from our heart. We process them. We process positive experiences. We process negative experiences, right? That's, that's how when certain things seem to be happening again, we're like, okay, hold on. This is a pattern. I need to stop being friends with you, right? The mind is where we're making those decisions. The heart is where we feel and have these emotions. The mind is also where we process sensations, uh, the five senses, sight, touch, smell, sound, taste. All of these things are happening in the mind, and that is how powerful our minds are. So I ask you this morning, what are you processing through? What are you thinking about? Craig Rochelle, pastor of Life Church in Oklahoma, says, our lives move in the direction of our strongest thoughts, and what we think shapes who we are. And if we're looking and thinking about this this quote in such a way, I believe what he's trying to say is that our minds are the steering wheel and our body would be the car. It's going to go in whatever direction it's guided in. All of these things are coming from our thoughts. So I ask you this morning, what's informing your thoughts? What's informing the direction of your life? What is the well or the source that you're pulling from as you go through life? Just something to consider. The interesting thing about mindsets is many of us have a certain desire when it comes to walking with Jesus to get closer to him. We have a desire to maybe change some habits. We have a desire to experience him. We have desires that we have for our faith journey with him. And I think many of us would like our journey to look a little bit different or we have some goals we would like to achieve. And all of those things start in our minds. There was a study conducted this past October um, by the Barner Group. The Barner Group is a Christian research organization. Uh, It was titled The Resilient Disciple. What they did was they developed uh, a protocol of four components of what are the four aspects of a resilient disciple, right? Uh, and the, what they were trying to find was the correlation between a person's commitment to Jesus and living a fulfilling life. And the four components they used were uh, one who attends church at least monthly and engages with their church uh, outside of the Sunday gathering. The second component was one who trusts in the authority of the Bible. The third component was This person is committed to Jesus personally and affirms that he was crucified, raised from the dead, and conquered sin and death. And the fourth component was that they agreed that they are someone who desires to transform the broader society as an outcome of their faith. What they found at the end of the study was at least 20% of those who took the survey meet the definition of a resilient disciple. 20% of people who consider themselves Christians meet the definition of a resilient disciple. 17% of those they surveyed are are those who habitually attend church or church-related activities, but do not believe in one or more of the four components that they've outlined to be uh, a resilient disciple. They also found that 60% of those surveyed had little to no engagement or haven't been involved with the church in over six months, six months or more throughout a given year. And what they also found was that 
resilient disciples are highly motivated to find a way to follow Jesus in a way that connects to their daily lives. I think the the biggest point is this last one, right? Because what this tells me is that when we live an integrated life, when we have a certain mindset of connecting our faith to who we are, that means that we, this sounds like these folks have taken off the mask. It sounds like these folks have, have found a way to have consistency in how they show up at church, how they show up at home, how they show up with their friends and family, how they show up in all these different spaces. They found a way to live an integrated life. And because they're free, not wearing a mask, carrying things or hiding, they're able to fully experience the life that Jesus has for them. This is telling us that when we have a faith that is connected to who we are and how we show up in the world, or when our faith is the source of our lives, we are able to live a fulfilling life. That's just something to ponder. And so when it comes to our mindset and and our heart and how they are informing the way we go through life, our thoughts, our feelings, our emotions... I think there, many of us can identify different areas that we would like to kind of tweak or adjust so that we could better experience Jesus. For some of us, that looks like changing some habits. For some of us, that looks like some very small things. But for some of us, there are also some very deeply rooted things that are holding us back, similar to the, the Batman versus Bruce Wayne effect. It's not as simple as a conversation. It's not as simple as just doing one, two, three. It's not as simple as reading a, help, a self-help book. It's not as simple as all these basic thing, people, things that people pretend can be basic. But some of us are carrying some deeply rooted things that it's not easy to change our mindset. It can almost be like bamboo. Has anyone here ever experienced bamboo? Bamboo is a vicious beast that will take over your yard, right? It's a vicious beast that can take over your yard. Bamboo uh, takes about six to eight years when planted to set up a rooting system. It's about three to four feet beneath uh, the ground surface. But while it spreads over there six to eight years, it's spreading out every three to four feet almost like a web, taking over the yard, taking over territory, doing whatever it wants to do, going wherever it's allowed to go. That's what bamboo does to a yard. Interesting thing is, for many of us, there are certain mindsets that are rooted deeply, just like bamboo is deeply rooted. The same way that bamboo takes over a yard and claims the territory, that is the same way that certain mindsets and traumas are so deeply ingrained in us that it seems like we can't move forward because there are some things that need to be addressed. And I'm talking about bamboo because I know. My, my childhood home uh, had a vicious bamboo issue. It was, it was horrible. I mean, every year about May and June, the bamboo would start sprouting up, and we would try to contain it at the beginning of the summer. And if we weren't able to get it contained, it would just be a long summer, and oftentimes my dad and I would just give up, <laughs> right? If, if, if you didn't go out there at least twice a week or once, every, once a week, the bamboo would consume your yard. Thank you, guys. <laughs> uh, the picture on the far right is, a, is an example of what our backyard would look like come mid-June and July. I'm not lying. <laughs> I'm, I'm so serious. So this, 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 this would be an example of what it's like when you have a certain mindset that's consuming you, right? We would often cut the bamboo down at the bottom of the stalk, but that's not dealing with the root, right? And that's why the bamboo continued to come back year after year and continue to spread. What's interesting it was, it wasn't just in our backyard, but it was in the backyard on the left, the backyard behind, and the backyard on the right. That's how vicious these deeply rooted beasts can be. 
And I think that many of us may be carrying things, right, may be wondering why we're not able to move forward in our faith, may be wondering why there are certain mindsets or habits that we can't change. It's because some of that stuff is just as deeply rooted in us like bamboo is. Three feet beneath the surface, taking six to eight years to set up a rooting system. Going back to the Bratman versus Bruce Wayne effect, we're talking about a little boy who's carried pain, guilt, shame, trauma, gone unaddressed throughout his childhood, teenage years, young adult life, to the point where now it's manifesting in his adult life to become someone that he's not. And I think that that is impacting many of us too. There are certain things that have happened throughout our lives, certain experiences, certain pains, certain traumas, certain experiences to where we haven't really had the tools or the support to address them. And we're wondering why we're not able to make certain strides relationally. We're wondering why we're not able to make certain strides faith-wise. We're wondering why we don't have enough faith to trust Jesus to do a certain thing in our lives. That's because certain things in us are deeply rooted. When we talk about deeply rooted mindsets, I'm going to throw one more research thing at you all. (laughs) There said there have been seven most common mindsets that keep believers from growing in their faith. The seven mindsets are legalism, pride, doubt, unforgiveness, worldly distractions, fear, and complacency. Research says that it's these seven things that plague believers in moving forward in their faith. I just want to take a brief moment to break them down. I won't be long here. I really want to get to the good stuff. (laughs) Uh, Legalism. Legalism is when a person is, is tends to focus on religious rules and regulations, and their spiritual growth can be hindered because they're they're being too rigid not focused on being loving, not focused on the grace of God, not focused on relationship. In fact, the way you're showing up is kind of hindering relationship with God and hindering relationship with people. Pride is an arrogance of self-righteousness and when you kind of know everything or you want to do everything your way. And this can just almost be like having a hard heart, right? Or you're just not open or teachable or teachable with others or teachable with God. The third one is doubt. Someone who just is not really trying to hear it, right? You, there's just a barrier that, that has hindered your spiritual growth because you refuse to trust Jesus. You refuse to trust others. Maybe you trust Jesus. Maybe you don't trust the community. Or maybe there's some things that have happened to you that keep you from believing, that keep you from trusting. Another issue, and this is a major one, unforgiveness. Someone may have offended you, done something wrong, and you refuse to let go until they apologize. Or maybe they apologize, but you still won't accept it because it hurts so much. This is another hindrance that we can experience. The fifth one is worldly distractions. Maybe too focused on material possessions. Maybe this individual is too focused on people, right? I, just, just worshiping your friends or worshiping your family or worshiping your career. And these things have become the main thing and they've been become more of a priority than God. Or maybe fear. Fear has dominated your mind to where you, you're, you're too scared to take, take a step for, forward, forward in, in relationship with Jesus. Take a, take a step forward and trusting him to do something in your life or just being too scared. And the last one is complacency. Just taking everything for granted. Oh, I, you know, I'm a believer. I'm good. (laughs) That's all I needed to do. I know I'm going to heaven. Maybe if opportunities come, sure. Maybe, maybe not. But it said that these are the seven mindsets, seven most common mindsets that keep the people of God from moving forward in their faith. And I think for each and every one of them, those aren't easy things to deal with. They're not. And I know that some of these things can be talked about like they're simple and easy to get over. But a lot of this stuff is deeply rooted in us. For some of us, we've had 
and most of the time you've had a certain experience or a certain teaching or there's something that has rooted this deeply in you. And I know just as much as the next person that anything that you continually revisit or any habit that is uh, consistently repeated, that becomes deeply rooted in you. And so it's not easy to break a mindset that is deeply rooted in you. This is what we would call a core lie, right? Something that, a belief that is on you, right? And this is a belief that is typically negative or, or just keeps you from moving forward or it, it just has a hold on your thoughts, or emotions, or behaviors. But in the kingdom, we call this a stronghold. Right? And a stronghold refers to a, a spiritual or an emotional force that exerts powerful influence over you that keeps you, right, that has a hold on you, and it, and it keeps you from moving forward in your faith. And it's very difficult to overcome. That sounds like something that's deeply rooted to me. And guess what? Because we're human, we tend to face a lot of this stuff with behavior modification. We try to make small changes. We try to make adjustments. We try to do all these things to kind of change the outcome. But I want to tell y'all something. A lot of these things are things we can't do in our own strength. And we were never meant to carry these things on our own. We have to trust Jesus with it. That's the difference between us and the rest of the world is The world is all about doing this to get this outcome. But Jesus is not just about doing this to get an outcome. Jesus is about transformation. A lot of times when we talk about deeply rooted issues, deeply rooted things, deeply rooted mindsets, deeply rooted sins, deeply rooted things that are holding us back, that's not meant to be carried by us. Jesus wants to carry that for us. We were never intended to carry these things on our own. And that is why it is very important that we consider what is the source in the well that we pull from as we go throughout life. That's why it says, guard your heart above all else, for it is the source of your life. And one thing I want to also emphasize is that A lot of this is the trick of the enemy as well. John chapter 10, verse 10 says, The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but Jesus comes that we may have life and have life to the full. Another verse says, abundantly. And so that tells us that although the enemy is after us, wants to get in our minds, wants to discourage us, wants us to carry these heavy things, he wants you to consider divorce. He wants you to consider giving up. He wants you to consider taking your eyes off Jesus. He wants you to pull from other sources. He wants you to be addicted to social media. He wants you to be tempted. All these things are intentionally done and planned to get our focus off of Jesus. All of these things are strategic so that we don't trust him. All of these things are strategic so that we go to another source, not Jesus as the source. And that is why it's important that we guard our hearts. You see, none of this is anything new. We have examples of this in Genesis 3 when when Satan approaches Eve and he says, did God really say not to eat from this tree? We have another example where where Job is in the book of Job where, where Satan is roaming around and God says, Satan, what are you doing? He says, roaming around from to and fro, seeking whom I may devour. And then he goes to wreck Job's life and put him to the test and see if he's still going to trust God in the end. And then we have another example in Matthew chapter 4 where Satan tests Jesus in the wilderness. And so I'm not sure how you're processing this message this morning. I'm not sure what you're carrying. I'm not sure what mindset is holding you back. I'm not sure where you stand. But what I do know is Jesus never intended us to go throughout life carrying deeply rooted pain, deeply rooted trauma, deeply rooted things that force us to wear a mask and pretend that everything's okay. Forcing us to wear a mask and to do it on our own. Forcing us to do things in our own strength. That was never his intent for us. 
Just like the Scripture says, he, Jesus comes that we may have life and have life to the full. That if Jesus is the source of our life, then we will be able to walk in freedom. Galatians 5.1 says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. So stand firm and do not again submit to the bond or the yoke of slavery. John chapter 8 verse 36 says, so if the Son has set you free, you will be free indeed. This leads me to believe that maybe I may, I may be burdened, I may be in prisons, I may, I may currently be wearing a mask or carrying heavy things, but it's not his intention. And that means that we don't have to stay where we are. And so if that's you today, if you're someone that, that's, that's burdened by a mindset or in prison, Jesus wants you to be free. Jesus wants you to not have to carry it anymore. And he wants you to be able to go out through life trusting in him depending on him. But like we said earlier, it's not just behavior modification. It takes transformation. One more quote before I prepare to close. James Allen says, and as a man think of, he says, let a man radically alter his thoughts and he will be astonished at the rapid transformation it will affect in the material conditions of his life. Sometimes we want change. Sometimes we want different outcomes. But there are some radical steps that need to be taken in order for us to get there. It's often not easy. However, it's necessary. Jesus wants you to take a necessary step. If you're someone here that's, that's carrying heavy things or, or you just have a certain mindset that's holding you back. I like to go back to my bamboo illustration of my parents' yard. Speaking of radical transformation, remember I told you what it used to look like? This is what it looks like now. That shed wasn't there. That concrete wasn't there. And we never were able to enjoy that backyard like that when I was a kid. However, after many years of my dad being frustrated, <laughs> we met someone named Mr. Dave, who was the father of our next door neighbor, Miss Shirley. Mr. Dave was from South Carolina. And he had dealt with bamboo before and getting rid of it. And speaking of radical things that need to happen in order to transition or transform or have a different outcome, one summer, Mr. Dave and my dad were discussing what needed to happen in order to remove and clear the bamboo. After a couple conversations, Mr. Dave noticed my dad hadn't yet gotten started. So what did Mr. Dave do out of the kindness of his heart? He one day showed up at our house with a pick and a shovel and a wheelbarrow. And what he did was he used that pick to dig three to four feet beneath the surface, and he would then shovel. And after he got enough space, he would pull out these roots of bamboo. And when he was pulling it out, he would then have to pick and shovel to the root, next root that it was connected to and then have to do the same thing over and over again. Can I tell you that after six long weeks of Mr. Dave picking, shoveling, wheelbarrowing, our backyard was just a big pile of dirt. <laughs> it was. I wish I had a picture of it. But that just goes to show that when things are deeply rooted in us, it's not just the cutting at the bottom of the stalk that changes the situation. There were many summers where my dad and I would cut, like I said, twice a week, once a week. And we had to stay on it weekly because once it consumed the backyard, we gave up for the summer. And so I'm not sure what things are holding you back, but I want to tell you this. A lot of things in our life are deeply rooted, and we need to trust Jesus for transformation. Of so many things that we're carrying, we can't do our own, and we were never meant to address these things on our own. And so I want to take us really quickly to some scriptures. You see, the title of my message today is Our Thoughts Have Power. And there are different mindsets that are holding us back. But I want to encourage us to be reminded that Jesus has more power than anything that we can ever experience. Jesus has more power than anything that we're carrying, anything that we're thinking. And he can change our situation. You see, if you need any evidence... Let me remind you that this is the same Jesus that we sing about in the song Resurrection Power. This is the same Jesus we sing about, death could not hold you, 
for you are the risen king. In fact, when we look at the story of Lazarus, I think that's a really great story. There's a story about Lazarus where he had passed away. And Mary and Martha were really sad. And Jesus is like, okay, cool. Y'all going to see the power of God today. Don't be sad. And fast forward in through the story, he says, didn't I tell you that you would see the glory of God? And then he proceeds to tell Lazarus, get up and come out. And Lazarus gets up. But it all started with Jesus asking a question, do you believe? And so today I want to ask you all, do you believe? Do you believe that Jesus has the power to change your situation? We've seen time and time again through history, throughout the stories, throughout the Gospels, that Jesus has the power to change and shift any situation. And that is one of the themes I love most about the Bible is that whenever there was a problem, Jesus was always the solution. And that's what I love so much about being a follower of Jesus. It's the fact that he has the power to change and shift any and every situation. Because he loves to use our impossible circumstances to demonstrate his glory and his power over all things. Because that's who he is. But the question is, are we ready to trust him to do so? Do you believe? It starts with making a decision to trust him to be exactly who he is. So maybe you're someone who is here today and there may be a mindset that is holding you back, a habit, something that you're looking to overcome, maybe a, a core lie you believe, maybe a stronghold. I want to close out by just sharing this psalm over you and with you. Psalm 139 verses 23 to 24 says, Search me, O God. Know my heart. Test me and know my concerns. See if there is any offensive way in me. And lead me in your everlasting way. The biggest part of transformation is transformation is something that we cannot do on our own. Transformation is a process of us surrendering and submitting to Jesus and allowing him to do a unique and special work in us. And so he can surgically shift, surgically remove, surgically change our perspective, surgically change our mindset, surgically change our responses. And briefly, I want to outline just some tools that maybe we could utilize if you're someone here that is looking for Jesus to meet you here and support you in this way. Verse 23 says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my concerns. The first thing we would need to engage in is reflection. Sometimes it is very hard to change the situation if we haven't paused and asked Jesus to meet us in the midst of our situation, take a step back and ask ourselves hard questions. When did this mindset start? Where did it come from? What are the hearts, habits, the thoughts, and the feelings that are holding me back? What are the patterns here? Reflection. The second thing we see in verse 24, see if there is any offensive way in me. What are the things in me? What is the mindset in me? What are the habits I possess that go against the word of God, that go against the mind of Christ, that go against the Jesus way of life? Maybe this is the difference. Maybe this is the thing that is, that is deeply rooted. I love the scripture in Septuagint Corinthians which says, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 10, 5, he says, we take every thought captive and speak to it with the knowledge of truth. Crow Groeschel says it like this, we cannot change that which we do not confront. And so after you've engaged in reflection and you've then identified what it is, we need to correct it. And that looks like prayer. It looks like sharing with someone about it. We may even need to see a professional. But there are some next steps that need to be associated with our reflection and our correction. One thing I forgot to mention in the first one, reflection, that gets back to the mind and the heart. Right? He says, search my heart. Test me and know my concerns. And the last thing we need to do is redirection in verse 24 where he says, lead me in your everlasting way. 
When we're carrying the mask and wearing the mask, that's us doing things in our own strength. That's us saying, my way is better. I got a better plan. I got a better way. I know what I'm doing. That looks like pride. That looks like us just, just trying to play the superhero in our own story. But Jesus is saying, if you trust me, I'll lead you in my everlasting way. And if there's someone here that's like, well, how do I do that? Well, I have three things for you. Prayer, asking him to meet you where you're at. Secondly, consuming the word so that he can shape and redirect your mindset. Asking him to replace your thoughts with his thoughts, with his ways. And then seek guidance, but continually asking him to shift your perspective as you surrender. So today as I close, I want to challenge everyone here under the sound of my voice to let Jesus change your thoughts so that he can change your life. Let Jesus change your thoughts so that he can change your life. Let him lead you in his everlasting way. Because when we do that, then we are guarding our hearts and allowing him to be the source of our lives. Let's pray, everyone. Father God, thank you so much for this day. Thank you, Lord, for just another opportunity to worship you in spirit and in truth, and hear from you. I just want to pray for everyone here, uh, whether it's a habit, whether it's a mindset, whether it's a cycle of sin, whether it's trauma, pain, heaviness. I pray that you would meet every individual here in the midst of their situation, that whatever they're carrying and have been experiencing maybe for some time or a long time, be it something small or something deeply rooted, I pray that they would trust you. Father God, you said, Lord, that there is nothing that you cannot do. In fact, you said that you were already aware of what we were carrying and experiencing. And we thank you for that. So, Father God, I pray that you would encourage us to trust you, to carry the situation, to be exactly who you said you are, because you are resurrection power. You do have the power to heal. You do have the power to change. You do have the power to transform. You do have the power to change the situation and transform our lives. But more importantly, I'm praying that you would be the trusted source. Because if we're trusting you to be the source, then we know that we'll go in a way that honors and glorifies you. So meet us here today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.